Uh, all right, cool. Let's kick it off. Welcome everyone to the end of Sprint Vanadium. Sprint 23, today we're going to be demoing Fleet 4.50. Uh, big release, lots of cool features. Uh, kind of the, the headline, of, a couple of headlines of this release, but the first one we're going to get into is the first use of AI-generated uh, calendar descriptions, but first, first, I guess, AI-enabled feature in the core product. So that's going to be really exciting to, to release and, and start getting some feedback. Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to Sharon and Endpoint Ops for their product feature demos. Yeah, thank you. So after we enjoyed the haiku in our PRs for some time, uh, we decided to also try to help our customers with AI. So uh, Rachel and Victor represent uh, the first usage of AI in calendar description. Take it, Rachel. Hey, everybody. I made a little video. So I'm going to share that just so everyone gets a little sneak peek of what that looks like in case we want to crop it or clip it um, any way you like. But this is, feel free to use this for customer facing anything. Um, so here's a walkthrough of so links to this doc. Um, as always, I record myself and then end up re-recording myself to just make it a little bit more polished. But um, I try not to be too polished because like you guys mentioned before. <laughs> Let's keep it real over here. Um, so yeah, I'll just I'll go ahead and play this and let me know if there's any issues with audio. I am going to walk you through our new feature, which is going to populate our policies, descriptions, and resolutions using AI. So currently, I think I have this disabled. Let me double check on my settings as an admin. I'm going to go to advanced options. And yeah, I disabled this last one. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. And so this setting now, which should be enabled for all users, allows me to create a new policy. So I click on add policy. And when I create my new policy, um, it could be one of those ones in the drop down there or just creating a new one from scratch. I'm going to have this option to create my name, resolution, etc. So for example, I'm going to steal one of my policies from fleetm.com queries, policies, macOS. I'm going to specifically look at the password requirement one. And I'm going to take this SQL that is provided by Fleets and I'm going to copy it into my Fleet app. So here's my new policy that I want to use. And I'm going to use it on macOS because this is a SQL that runs specifically on macOS. And then I'm going to label it uh, password length of 10 characters macOS. Awesome. And I'm greeted with this really empty form, which is not the best user experience. So to make it a little bit more delightful, we added these new policy buttons that will autofill your description and resolution. And these buttons will call the same API. And as it's calling it, you'll see this loading state. And when it is finished, it will populate only the box that you clicked on. But if you wanted to populate both boxes, you just click another one and it will automatically populate because it's already called the API. And so basically it reads this policy SQL and it sends it to our AI generator that will generate description and resolution based on the SQL. So you can see that this laptop security could be compromised with a weak password policy, so it doesn't meet the minimum requirement of 10 characters. And during maintenance, this is what we plan to um, do with your, with your laptop or what should happen. Um, but say I really don't want 10 characters, I really want to have 12 characters. So I can go ahead and update my SQL. And anytime you update your SQL on this new policy page and you hit save, you're back to the save modal. You can now re-hit an API because we can tell on the front end that you have changed your SQL. And so it will create a new description. And if you want to change your resolution, there it is as well. So this is going to not use um, 10 characters anymore. It's actually 12 characters minimum. Um, so yeah, um, that's just one way to use this. If you go ahead and hit save, you'll see that this is now shown to our fleet admins or anybody who has fleet access. But what is nice about this is we're being transparent not only to our fleet users, but their end users can actually see these policies on their devices. So if you were to go to um, my device specifically, um, maybe I should open my device. Let's not open my device because it has all my information on there, but you'll see that the policy will show up with that description and resolution. And then also, if you were to be on a specific team, you can create these calendar events in which we made sure that these new policy um, AI descriptions and resolutions um, fit well with what the end user is going to see on their Google calendar event um, 
which is a recent feature that we added. So if we click on preview, you can see here that um, we're going to have your organization name say that it reserved this time to make some changes on the computer. Specifically, we were looking at the antivirus one, so you see the why it matters on what we'll do. So I'm going to go to the password protection one specifically. So there it is, link up 10 characters. And I'm going to show you that it reads really nicely to your end users as well. So here's the generic one when you click on the top right. So you, your organization reserved this time. But if you go to um, password protected one, you'll see here that the why it matters is being answered. And these two important questions, why it matters and what we'll do is being transparent to your end users as well. So why does it matter? This laptop may be weak, um, have a weak password policy, increasing vulnerabilities to brute force and dictionary attacks. Users' accounts may be easily compromised, potentially leading to unauthorized access data breaches, blah, blah. And then the second important question that we're answering is what we'll do. So during this maintenance, if you schedule a calendar event uh, maintenance webhook to fire some scripts that will do this, um, we are telling your end users that during this maintenance that IT will likely enforce stronger password policies. And so this is what your end user is going to see, and this is what you're going to see in the fleet UI, and everything is going to be a little bit more delightful for everybody. Cool. I'm going to walk you oh. through our new feature. And that was a joint effort of me and Victor on the back end, but also Rachel Shaw did a lot of the work to make the API returned something that looked human, readable, interpretable, and friendly. So if you have any questions, we can field them now. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. And I just want to uh, second what you said. Uh, we get, we engineering present the results and get all the glory, but definitely there's a lot of common work with the product team, we work together as a big team and uh, it's a common effort. So thank you for mentioning that and thank you for product team for doing a great job here. Uh, next we have Victor with a few features. So I'll let Victor present them. Take it, Victor. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, so first a couple notes for the AI uh, calendar descriptions. So we have the endpoint now, out of field policy. So this is endpoints, not like publicly documented, but it's for developers. So we can, you know, for example, try to try to run this on this brand new table that we're also adding um, and see what it returns. Doopty doopty doop. Um, yep. Cyber threats, unpatched CVs, yeah, um, looks reasonable. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is like, how do you configure um, in GitOps? On GitOps, um, by configure, I mean, how do you enable, disable? So by default, uh, this is false. But if you want to configure it otherwise, um, in GitOps, it's under org settings, service settings, AI features disabled. OK, next I'll move on to a uh, kind of what I'm calling a meta feature that I made specifically for sprint demos. So um, sometimes we are you know, looking at stuff on, uh, on a fleet, and there's certain sensitive information we don't want to make public, like our public IP or email addresses, and you kind of you kind of want to blur them. So I basically made a Chrome extension, quick and dirty Chrome extension that does this blurring. I'm calling it open blur. It's very basic. You put in the strings you want to blur, and then it uh, blurs things dynamically. Um, it's under um, get Victor open blur, and there's, there's a video instructions how to install it. Basically, you can install it by downloading, downloading this and installing it. Um, and it is dynamic. So like if I type in somebody at fleetdm.com, you see, getting blurred. That, um, is, that is so cool. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we have a Chrome extension, right? Or a Fleet D Chrome. So this potentially could be a security policy, right? If you imagine you have a company with employees working in public spaces, 
and they don't want to expose some sensitive information. So there could be a company policy for blurring, you know, things like emails, IPs, etc. Um, okay, so now moving on to the next feature, which is uh, new tables. So we updated our Mac admins extension with some new tables. There's like links, um, links to those descriptions in the sprint demo notes, but I'm gonna, you know, show show some results from those tables. So first we have select star from uh, SOFA security release info. So SOFA is uh, a Mac admins security uh, kind of database. So I said query this table, it basically just tells me, you know, information about my last release how many CVs were fixed in the last release, how many days it's been, uh, or how many days it's been since the previous release, so like from 14.4.0. Um, and I can do use where here, where OS version to get information from previous releases. So like it'll give me a row for, you know, 14.4. So that's the security release info. The other table is SOFA unpatched CVEs. Select star from SOFA unpatched CVEs. So this tells you exactly, it actually tells you how many CVEs your OS has that have not been patched. And you see it's, it's returning nothing for me right now. So this could actually be a, a policy. You can actually have a policy um, to make sure your OS doesn't have any unpatched CVEs. Um, but once again, here, you can get the information from an older version. Uh, it's really old. There's going to be a lot. So you can get like, you know, all the CVEs. If, if you were, were still running on 13.0, all the CVEs you, you, you're vulnerable to. Okay, that concludes the tables. Now moving on to some GitOps features. Uh, so first GitOps feature is kind of a um, um, it's useful for us and it, it's uh, applicable to our GitOps, uh, fleet GitOps uh, repo. So now we can do dry runs on pull requests. So I have integrated into, uh, into dog food. So for demo purposes, I created a pull request where I basically, you know, put in some bad syntax here. And I have this enabled to run on pull requests now. And you see it's running apply latest configuration. Um, and it's only running a dry run. Now, if you, you know, this kind of makes life easier for, for anyone modifying GitOps because now It'll run in dry run mode, and it should catch most of the errors. Um, OK, the other GitOps feature is removing teams. So let me go ahead and demo that. So there's a couple of things that have changed. I'm going to go to uh, directory with some some information. So first of all, uh, for the first thing I want to cover is that you can GitOps can now take multiple files. Lead control GitOps dash F default dash F. I have some teams here. And I'm going to specify dry run. So, for, so first thing is it now can process multiple files at the same time. So you only need it to run once to apply like the entire configuration to your um, to your fleet. And the second thing I've added is this uh, the ability to delete teams. So it, it needs it requires another team, another switch called delete delete other teams. And if we look at my at my server, I have this this team that has someone has introduced 
and that's not part of my GitOps config. So if I run it with delete other teams, it would tell me here in the dry run that it would delete this, this other team that wasn't part of my, my config that I passed in. So I can run it now without the dry run. And so it deleted that team. So if we go back here and refresh, so that sneaky team is gone. Um, so this is not yet deployed in the in our GitOps uh, repository because our GitOps repository is running on the released version of Fleet Control. So once we release this version of Fleet Control, then I'll update our uh, Fleet GitOps repo to, to use this functionality. Um, next feature is just a quick mention that we're now going to be in the next uh, Fleet D release. Our orbit.exe and fleet desktop.exe are going to be signed. Uh, Windows signing. So we have that flow working. Um, I have an example. The best way to check whether something's signed on Windows is you use this get authenticode signature uh, method and I type it to. Uh, format dash list to get more info out of it. So if I run this, it'll it'll give the information about our signature. So you see signed by Fleet Device Management, et cetera. And if you run it on an unsigned one, it'll just say not signed. Um, so those two Windows files are now signed. Um, the last thing I want to cover is um, Fleet D base. So this is the story description. Um, so we have ability to create a, a base build of Fleet D without uh, server URL and without the uh, secret. And for macOS, the way it works is you can pass the secret and URL in the MDM profile. And for Windows, you have to pass them on the command line. So we're now generating those, those builds, and they're available on download.fleetdm.com. Um, there's also a meta file there that kind of that's being used to track. That's being used to track. Um, the actual versions that the, the, my workflow is, is using this to track um, whether whether they need to be updated or not. Uh, so I did want to show the workflow. Uh, this workflow is running nightly. So nightly, we update these base builds nightly. Um, another thing I wanted to show is you know we use this command huff status and then we compare it to this meta.json file to see if the update is needed. Um, and then we build the fleet um, fleet for Mac. On Mac, we use a new certificate, a different certificate for signing. We need to have a special certificate to sign the PKG files. So that PKG file is signed um, on Windows. And, and we our fleet control does support signing uh, with this dash sign identity dash dash notarize switch. So, you know, we natively support signing a package with fleet control. Um, on Microsoft, it's a dot MSI file. It is not signed. Uh, so one cool thing I want to show is not makes it easier. Like if you're uh, for developers, if you got your device off of, off of uh, dog food, like my device is off of dog food right now, and you want to get it on DocFood, all you need to do is just download this base package. And if you have the MDM profile that provides the server, um, uh, the server and the, and the secret, the enroll secret, no password. What about Touch ID? Um, and then that's like the fastest way, like not the fastest way, but maybe the easiest way to get it back on dog food. And now if I refresh, okay, maybe not, I refresh again. 
See, my device is on dog food right now. It's online. That's a quick way to get your device back onto dog food, just using that base package. Uh, that's, all for, that's it for the features. Back to you, Sharon. And uh, Brock, Brock had a question uh, during your demo. I wanted to make sure we, we have well, a chance. It was actually a question about the AI key values. So, so any AI features that we build in the future will also just be handled by that single false or true key value. Is that right? Yeah, that's the plan. Okay, cool. Okay, thank you, Victor. And next, Rachel, Jacob, and team will present a feature of merging inherited queries and policies into the team tables. Uh, Rachel, are you starting? Uh, yeah, I created a video for this. Um, this was a big joint effort between Jacob and I a few weeks ago. Um, and yeah, it's a lot of um, front-end changes, so... Um, just be aware that we have this new, this new look to the policies and queries page. So I'll go ahead and start building it for us. And... Great, and here's one major change to the UI that our users will see. So we are currently on all teams view and we can look at queries and policies. And you can see that we have 20 rows of um, global or all teams queries that run on every host and the same thing with policies. And this is paginated to show the first 20 only. And what our users were saying was, why is it when we are on team view, do we have double the tables? So for team view, we initially had a team level table and then down below we had a second 20 row long global or all teams table to show you what inherited policies and queries were also being ran on those hosts. So instead, we mix the two together. We changed the API to include a new um, parameter called merge underscore inherited. And if that's set to true, which is set to true for all of our UI, um, you will now have the inherited um, queries in with your team level queries as well. So if I'm looking at this policies page, you can see anything that has inherited has this little inherited icon with a tooltip over it. And you can see that our team level policies do not have that. And our team level policies are editable from the team level page. So you can delete that from here. Another thing I wanted you to note is that when you manage your automations um, for your calendar events, for your policies, because this is paginated on the server side and we're only looking at the first 20 policies, partially because um, you know, running running the script to count all the hosts for, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of hosts for some of our customers um, takes a lot of time. So that's why we want to only show um, 20 rows at a time. But when you go to manage your calendar events or your other workflows, you'll see that your team level policies here only match the policies that are shown on the screen. And so we would absolutely love feedback um, on how this UI works, whether we like it or not, things that can be improved on, um, things that we love. Uh, we are currently already starting to work on version two, as this was kind of like our minimum viable um, feature. And our second version, we're already thinking about adding a show inherited policies toggle. So this emptiness of not having these checkboxes here will not be so distracting. We might actually add disabled checkboxes, so it's not so distracting as well. Um, and clicking on a toggle here might show the inherited one, so that way you're not distracted by inherited policies as you're looking at them team level ones. But for now, this is our first pass. This is our, <clears throat> our newest change to our policies page. <clears throat> One thing I want to note is we also added this to our queries page. And so the difference between the policies and queries page is the queries page isn't as expensive to run for hundreds of thousands of posts because we're not aggregating that kind of data. So here, when you go to manage your automations, you can see your automations um, for every single page because the pagination on this page is doing is on the client side. And so you'll see every policy from every page in this manage automations modal. And then um, I just wanted to note that these checkboxes on the left side, that's only for deleting policies. So this would select the two that are on the page and delete those two. Um, and same thing with these, they would only delete the team level policies. If you wanted to be a team, not a team, a global admin like I am, and delete inherited policies, you would then need to go back to all teams where you can then delete your inherited policies as such. You can also manage your automations for other workflows for inherited policies as such. And as we already know, um, you can only schedule calendar events for specific teams. So 
Yeah, those are the new changes to the policies and queries UI. Okay. Any questions on that? And yeah, this was a request from one of our major customers. So um, looking forward to the, the next little round of cleaning up this UI. And I think Rachel's got some designs going already. So. Hey, thank you, Rachel, Jacob, and team. And next, the Endpoint Ops team uh, did a proof of concept uh, research for um, getting information of from iOS and iPadOS, aka iPhone and I iPad. And Lucas will present. Uh, so, as you all know, uh, we don't have an OS query version for that. And uh, nonetheless, Lucas managed to uh, take non negligible information from those devices, and Lucas will present it. Please take it. Hey. All right, I'll share my screen and um, yeah, so we did a little bit of research about adding iOS and iPadOS support to Fleet. Um, and well, as you probably know, like the MDM protocol is the same for any Apple device. So right here we have, um, uh, and actually I have just one iPhone, my personal phone. So I even rolled my personal phone manually. Um, to my local fleet, and I added some like tags here. Uh, you can see this is the worst code, but basically, um, you can see that I am. Um, I just added this small thing where uh, I send a command. Um, so let me just. So here's the device. The device was uh, successfully. And we get some data from the device that I'm going to show you how we get that data. Uh, it's not a lot. And um, the, the difference here, as Sharon said, is we don't have a query. So a lot of these will go away, like this will go away. No users here, labels may stay, activity probably will go away, um, and a few other things. But we have some data that MDM provides for these devices. Um, the way I got data from my personal device, again, uh, like for example, online doesn't make sense if we don't have OS query. Uh, and a few things. So we have to reconsider a few things. This will be the first platform uh, that we support without SQL, uh, OS query SQL, right? Because Chrome, even Chrome has like a sort of S uh, OS query support. Um, so what I did just for this personal concept is, um, so it works and then you can send commands to this, um, wait, I'm on the wrong folder. Wrong demo, okay. Uh, you can send commands, uh, for example, in this case, I'm sending device information, uh, XML, I'll show to my, this is my iPhone, please uh, hide this, but this is my iPhone uh, UID. And if we look at device information, it just uh, it gets a lot of data from the device. It's a command to get data, right? A lot of data. Um, so when I send that command to my phone, I do get stuff um, from it. Um, what is it? Uh, uh, so I get like iPhone. I have an iPhone SE a bunch of other information. And what I did on the fleet server was just a hack to get that result. So what I do is um, if this is my phone and I, it contains this response, then I update the host table. And that's why we have this, uh, for example, the disk space available that is provided by MDM. Um, and then the version of the iOS, serial, and a few other things. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's it. I mean, the proof of concept, um, uh, like we basically learned a lot with the proof of concept, and I believe we're gonna implement actual like minimal support for our iPhone and iOS. Uh, sorry, for iOS and iPadOS uh, soon. Yeah. Um, oh, and I, and I actually got so we have these controls. Uh, 
uh, this uh, password policy to record 10 characters. I was using this for GitOps and it's so annoying. I had to change my phone uh, password to, to comply to the policy. So, uh, you know, uh, profiles are working on my, my iPhone. Um, all right, that's about it on, on that feature. Uh, next, we have the um, delete activities. Uh, Rachel, would you like to show something first here or should I just demo this? Uh, you can just demo it. The UI is available in main. Okay, so we added a new option here called delete activities. Um, so you toggle and you can select these uh, three settings. And what this means is that uh, these activities that you will see here uh, will get removed if they are older, like old activities. Um, and the reason we want to provide these functionalities because you know as time as time passes, like the database will uh, grow with these activities, and some customers may not want to have. I don't know, activities that are two years old on their database and they, they took up space. And so yeah, the, by enabling that, so let's try that. Uh, let me see if I can delete at least, um, I don't know if I have any that are 30 day older on this deployment, but we can try with one. So let's try with the last activity. I'll do a small uh, thing here, so. just to simulate that this activity is uh, old. Um, um, all right, let's do a select ID activities and I'll get the last, oh, there's a lot here. So give me a sec. So I wanna pick one that it's not, um, okay, I think it's this one, the live query, all right? So I'll do that. I'll turn this activity into something that was I simulate that, uh, so that so that this activity is 35 days old. Uh, and then um, when I run the cleaner, this will run every one hour. Uh, I think it should be gone from here. Well, it's still here. So I probably picked the wrong one. Uh, but again, trust me that once you run this, uh, it will go away. And th there's one important thing that I believe we documented this somewhere is that um, uh, we're going to only, uh, Fleet will only delete uh, 5,000 activities at a time every hour. This is so that we don't want to lock the database for too long uh, because otherwise it will make the whole application slow. So we're going to delete them slowly for all uh, deployments. And I think that's about it. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Lucas. And last for the features, we have team presenting additional uh, vulnerability source from Oval or Ubuntu systems and optimizing result processing. Team, take it. Hey, so yes, I want to show this real quick. We um, This is a very small uh, uh, unplanned feature, um, adding a couple sources. Uh, if you, you may or may not have noticed or known that um, Ubuntu released a new LTS version, 2404 Noble. Nimbat, I got that right. Just wanted to show how a very small diff, um, very small related diff as well on the fleet server. Uh, so very small things I think that can make um, uh, customers um, uh, pretty happy, especially around renewal time. So just want to point that out. Um, the next one was a small optimization for pack delimiters. If you're familiar with pack delimiters, this is what uh, kind of the name looks like when it comes back to fleet. Um, the pack delimiter on the left side here is a forward slash, um, but we also technically support anything as a pack delimiter. Um, and so that is a, uh, that is a much, uh, much harder problem here on the, on the right side uh, to solve. And so what we did uh, we did here was uh, make an optimization for the left side because that's really the, the the common use case. So I uh, just want to show. I think I had some metrics here. Um, much 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 faster. I don't know what that comes out. About three times faster um, for the for the common use case. Um, I also have a, a soapbox feature request for Noah to uh, to to limit that officially. We'll see if uh, we'll see if that uh, that goes through. Is that something we want to support? 
Uh, but that's all I got. Okay, thank you. And look back to you. This is these are all the features. We'll get back with uh, improvements and fixes. Great work, everyone on Endpoint Ops. So some really exciting uh, features and, and overall improvements. Next, over to George and the MDM team for their features. All righty, we've got two uh, little fleet control updates from Dante, but then we've got a big meaty feature that the entire team worked on uh, completely this entire sprint. That's going to be demoed by Gabe. And then I've got two small fleet control updates to sandwich that off. So Dante, take it away. Sure. Just let me share my screen here. Uh, so the first one is the fact that uh, many fleet commands, uh, if you're doing it via the command line, require your team ID. Uh, and there was actually no convenient way to get the team ID from fleet CTL until now. So now when you get fleet CTL, you get the team ID column. So you can, instead of having to go into the web interface or parse it out from a YAML output, uh, it just appears here. That's one of them. That's a very quick fix. Uh, and the second one, which I can't properly demo right now because I don't have my local TUF server going, is that you can now uh, run ZSH scripts on fleet. Previously, we could only run uh, shell scripts using POSIX shell, uh, but now we can run ZSH scripts. So I'll show you what it can do now, at least, is that we also have the front end updated. So you'll see, for example, this ZSH script. It has user bin ZSH at the top. I can upload that, and it'll work properly, and you can run it. Uh, and it'll also validate against other shebangs. So in this case, I have a Python shebang in this script, and it says couldn't upload, only supports uh, shell and ZSH. So I'll show you the Python one. Looks like this and just has user bin Python at the top. That's it. Those are the two quick updates. Thank you, Dante. And Gabe with the uh, software delivery, security, security delivery. Hey guys, share my screen. Um, Okay, so yeah, like George said, this is a pretty massive feature um, that we've been focused on, the whole team, all Sprint. Um, it's still not 100%, um, but it, it's getting close. I'll When I'm demoing it, I'll, I'll kind of mention the places where it's, it's not quite there, but I'll show you what I can. So um, if I go to the software page now, you see that we have this add software button. And this will allow user to um, upload a piece of software. So the first condition is that um, you can only add softwares related to or um, in the context of a team. So I'm going to switch to team one. I'm going to click this add software again. And now you see a form to add uh, upload a piece of software. Um, I just have this package right here that I've been using. Um, so I select that one, and you can see this install script. Um, this is editable. Um, by default, depending on the package type, you have different scripts that are going to run. But a user can edit this if they wanted to, I don't know, put, some, put it somewhere specific or change the install script. And this will get run, as it says here, um, on the host when it's installing. You also have a couple of other options when uploading a software. Um, you have these two pre-install condition and post-install script. So for the pre-install condition, um, you can define a query. And the uh, like it says down here, it'll only be installed um, if the query returns these results. So I'm just going to do a really random query right now. And I can also have a post-install script. And this will get run on the hosts after the the install script is run. Um, I don't know, something like that. Um, I'm just going to disable these for now just to upload the, the package. So I'm going to do add software. And now you can see that we've uploaded this software. Um, so now that I can see the software in the software table, um, we have a couple of other options for filtering. So you see now we have this new available for install. Um, this filters the tables by installable software. 
Um, if I, I can change that, so that just works like normal. Um, I'm gonna click into here, the fleet OS query. This is the package I just uploaded. And we'll see uh, some of the same info we saw, but now we have this new card right here, which gives you a bit more detail of the package that you've, you've uploaded. Um, right now, I don't have posts online on this team, so you're not seeing these numbers reflected, but um, you should see the number of hosts that are installed, the number of hosts that have this package pending, and then the number of hosts that have tried to install it but failed. Um, you'll see that down here. Um, a bit that we're still working on is if you click on this, you see how it kind of has this purple text. This is a link, and this will go to the manage host page, and you'll be able to see uh, the table of hosts that, that um, are in this package installed state. Um, but that's a bit that we still have to, to finish up. Um, you'll see some buttons over here on the right. So obviously, you can delete this. Uh, I'll, I'll show you this one last, actually. Um, this is another bit where we have to finish up, but if I click on this gear, this opens a modal that shows you some of the info. So you should be seeing here the install script that you saw me, um, that you saw added when we uploaded the package. This is a bit we have to finish, but you'll see that same install script. If you had a query that you wrote, you'll see that too. And if you had a, um, a post install script that you wrote, you'll see that too. And these will all be README. So this just gives the, the user a bit more information to remind them what they uploaded this package with. Um, you can also download this. So this is another bit where we have to look and see. Um, we have to finish. But uh, clicking on this button will download the script. And then the last bit is deleting the script. This will open up a modal. And you can delete this, uh, this software. Um, one bit that we have to look at is refreshing the page because you shouldn't see this card anymore, but it is in fact deleted. So if I go back to available and first available for install, you won't see it anymore. I'm just going to re upload it just real quick so I can show you a bit more. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to go to hosts. So I have one host on the same team. Um, where I uploaded the software. It's not online, so it hasn't tried to install it yet. But I'm gonna go into the host details and I'm gonna look at its software uh, on this host. I'm going to search for this fleet OS query and you can see now I have this install status column. So for the softwares that um, IT admins have installed, um, they'll see the various states that it's in. So you'll see, uh, like you see here, available for install, you'll see installed, pending, and failed. Um, and then if you look over here on actions, we need to fix up some of this UI polish of this overflow. But you can see you have a couple of options here. One is to show the details of this software. And then one is to try to install the software. Um, the install one, again, is something we're looking at finishing up, but if you click this as a user, that will try to install the this software on this host that you're looking at. Um, currently doesn't work right now, but we're finishing that up. And then the uh, show details, you're not gonna see much details for this one yet uh, because there's no installed versions. But for example, if I go to another software and I show the details there, um, you just see a bit more information about that software uh, displayed to you. Um, I can't show you this right now, but this there is more information displayed if this software has been installed. You'll see some install results. Um, still need to integrate with that bit. So that's a bit we're finishing up. And the last bit I can show you is the activities. So you saw me upload and delete a couple of softwares and you'll just see those activities here. So you see the activity for adding the software and you see the activity for deleting it. And there is another activity for installing, but because that's not currently working, I, I can't show it to you here, um, but there will be a activity for installing that will show the details of that install. So you'll see the, uh, I think it's the different outputs of, of what happened on that machine where you were trying to install. Um, 
trying to think if I forgot anything else. I think that's the main bit. Um, yeah, any questions on all that? There's a question for product um, on the host details software table. We used to have vulnerabilities drop down on there. Why is it being removed? I don't know if that was removed. Go for it, Rachel. It might might not have any. No, it was. There's a new uh, um new API endpoint that powers this table now, um, and we cut it to move quickly. But we can always we can bring it back in future iterations. Yeah. So that's a couple of uh, something behind the scenes is that yes, it's this is all powered by a new API endpoint. Um, which it was before um, bookmarkable because I think Rachel, you did a lot of work to, to make sure it was. Um, it's still bookmarkable. So for example, if I did that query, um, you can see the, this bit right here and I could just send that to someone and they'll see the same page that I see. But yeah, this is all being powered by a uh, new host software API. Um, some, there's some little details here also I forgot to mention. So there, some of these, or all of them actually have a tool tip that give you a bit more information on the what this status means um, for users. Um, it, you, won't, you don't see any vulnerabilities here, but it behaves similar to how vulnerabilities, uh, if you have multiple, you'll see tool tips that tell you the first three and then additional more. So you just have a bit more information on um, on your software on the host uh, in these tables. Any other questions? Is whatever we're doing to make the scripts visible in that little GUI element, uh, anything that can be used to also make scripts viewable? at least in a read only way in the GUI. So if you clicked uh, on a script, you would actually see it instead of just being able to download it. No, oh, this, is, uh, this is not technically tied to the scripts feature. Okay. Mm -hmm. These are separate tables, separate APIs uh, bundled under the software install concept. All righty, thank you so much, Gabe. And then we got a little, little palette cleanser after this of uh, just some fleet CTL updates. So what I have here is just a little showcase of the use case I ran into, which is why I wanted to build it for myself in the first place. I had uploaded quite a few um, different scripts to my server that I use as my um, QA setup. And I wanted to be able to store them as backup because I had kind of pulled them from all over the place. Um, but Fleet Control didn't have a Git scripts uh, functionality. And I knew we had this all in the API. Um, and so I kind of grabbed this concept from G8 API, which is the GitHub CLI client. And then they just let you hit any API endpoint after that. And it basically uses your authentication that you set up with the GitHub client to be able to do those API uh, calls and gives you the raw response back. So if we take a look here, if I'm gonna remove dragon limit script star, we now have an empty, uh, we have an empty folder there. We can take a look at the raw response of, did I not build? Apologies. Mm. That's not correct. Mm. Thought I had this ready. Oh, I see. Here we go. While that's going ahead and building, we'll just take a look here. You'll take API and you're allowed to add query parameters with the dash F field. 
And then you can hit any API endpoint here, API v1 fleet scripts, uh, you are allowed. Let's try this again. Hey, there we go. Def H for help. And we can uh secret. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, it's crit. There we go. We can take this and we can run this to see the raw output. I have a tag. There we go. So we get the raw response. And uh, we have our metadata, we have scripts, we have all of my IDs and their names, the creation dates. And then with just a little bit of JQ, we can just extract the IDs that I wanted to be able to do it. And then um, basically just run this script where we add in the query parameter alt equals media to be able to download. We'll just go ahead and We'll run this now. I haven't figured out how to suppress this warning, but now if we take a look at Dragon Limit script, we now have the contents of all of my um, save scripts, which is pretty simple. Uh, but this kind of opens up a lot of debug possibilities. You can you can use this when you're adding a new endpoint. You can just use this to quickly iterate on hitting the API and testing locally. Pretty useful. And one last little update to Fleet CCL is run script. Um, so we have let's see here. Let's do build Fleet CCL. Yeah. Oh. And I've got the host that I'm currently running this from. And run script. Never remember, is it run scripts? Run script. Host there. And then now I can just say flash ls opt. And now this is running with the script contents as what I put at the end of here. And that's all I've got in Slash Opt. There we go. Makes sense. But we can also do dash dash Wyatt because I don't want to see the uh, output script is running. Please wait for it to finish. I want to probably pass this into pipe and be able to evaluate the output by itself without that and without this exit code zero and all of the other formatting we had. So now I just have the raw response from LSOP. And then if I make a top typo, you know, we can we can do our debugging much quicker than if I had to go modify the script, upload the script, run the script, you know, constantly be passing a file instead of just the raw content at the end of fleet control run scripts. Come on, real fast. I think I can. I think I can. There we go. LS cannot access slash op. No such file. And that concludes my demo and the MDM demos. Back to you, Luke. That's really cool, George. Uh, it's great to see these type of efficiency improvements that are that are going to pay dividends over time. Uh, and great idea from Lucas. Wrap fleet control run script in an interactive shell, and you have a root uh, SSH like experience. So yeah, really cool to see like. Uh, I think it's it's a uh, we spent a long time uh, building the foundational part of the fleet product, and now we're getting to the point where we're starting to really build the enhancements and the innovations on top of it. It's really exciting to see the pace that we're starting to move, and that we're going to continue to move with so much of the foundational work done. Uh, the the step in MDM maturity is huge, adding app management and deployment. Uh, the two features we're really missing to be to be fully mature and competitive in the market is is iOS support and app management. By the end of Q2, we're going to have both of those. So that is uh, really exciting to be to be reaching that that milestone. And then after that, we're so used to moving fast, we're just going to be blazing past uh, all the other products. So excited to, to see that happen. Uh, so I'm actually going to demo something. It's been a long time. So I'm going to attempt to be demo gods and try to deploy from zero to, to deployed on render in real time. 
Uh, this is not my work. This is Ben Edwards, but he's not on the call and I, I wanted to show it off. So uh, we now on GitHub in the fleet infrastructure render directory have this deploy to render, one click deploy process. We'll record I have, a video of this one. I, I have my video, Luke, if you want to watch it. Do you? Where's it at? It's, it's uh, hang on. Okay, cool. Yeah, if you want to present it, this is it when it was working. Uh, and you, sounds you, like Brock had to have better foresight than me and recorded it. Uh, <laughs> Do you want me to show it? It's about yeah, that'd, yeah, that'd be great. Just under four minutes. Okay. Um, and it's me talking and being really annoying. So sorry, everybody. Um, wait. Here we go. I am a customer solutions architect at Fleet. And in this video, I'm going to show you uh, the newest way to set up a Fleet instance on Render. For those of you that don't know, Render is a cloud application hosting platform that is pretty slick. And if you don't have uh, a Render account, you can sign up for one here. I have already created a Render account and I have a Google account as well. This is a very, very easy way to create your account. I am logged in. I do not have any Blueprint instances. Uh, and this is kind of your standard default dashboard. Uh, you should notice something about this guide. It is very short. Big thanks to Ben Edwards, who is one of our infrastructure engineers uh, at Fleet, for setting this up. The deployment guide, we talk about the services overview. We talk about MySQL and Redis, which are kind of the back end that you need to set up for a fleet instance. And there's some prerequisites. You'll see that you need an account on render. And that's it. Steps to deploy are click the deploy on render button. This purple button right here. So we're going to do that. And in some ways, that will make this video very exciting. And other ways, not that exciting. You're not going to want to watch a progress bar spinning for around five minutes, which is about how long it takes to set this up. So I'll be trimming that part out of the video and I will come back to you uh, after it's all set up. First things first, we're going to click the button. I'm going to come up with a name for my blueprint in render. And I'm going to call this Brock Tests Lead Render. Uh, I'm going to follow the advice here to just leave everything set to its default, and I'm going to click the apply button. And now we see the little wheelies starting to spin. I'll come back when the wheelies are done spinning. So if I go back to the dashboard here, sorry, the blueprints page, you will see that all of my little uh, wheelies there are now green. Uh, that means that the services have been configured. And if I go look at my dashboard, you will see that I now have these three fleet services. I have the MySQL service, I have the Redis service, and I have fleet. If I click on fleet, you will see that I have a URL here. And if I click on that, this will take me to my fleet instance, which has been set up. I'm going to fill this out to create my first fleet user. So I'm going to put in my full name and my email address. And a very super secure password. And I'm gonna make an organization for myself called Org, and I'm gonna give it the URL of rockorg.org, because that makes sense to me. And that has just auto-populated my URL for the instance. And when I click Next and Confirm, blam, there is my fleet instance ready to rock, or one might say ready to rock. Uh, that's it. That is how easy it is to now set up an instance of fleet on render. It's amazing. Thanks again to Ben Edwards. Uh, thanks, everybody. There you go. That's an awesome demo. That was perfect. It was better than what I was going to demo. So, but, so thank you for that. Uh, all right, cool. So over back over to Endpoint Ops for bug fixes and improvements. Quick note, it is currently 12.05, and we have it until 12.30. So we'll need to move through all the bugs relatively quickly. 
Okay, I'll try to be quick. Uh, what I want to present could easily take an hour, so I'll try to pr uh, push it into uh, maybe uh, less than 10 minutes. Um, one of our tasks were, was to uh, 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 do a video of uh, how we can collect uh, telemetry and information better or like EDR. And drilling down into it, we actually discovered that there is a lot of capabilities that we already have and possess. And uh, we're not sure that our customers are using it or even know about it. So I would like to talk a little bit about EDR and what we have, what parts of it we can do. Uh, I'll start with the very basics of uh, what is EDR. I'm sure a lot of people here know what EDR means, but for some of us that do not know, I'll give a very quick analogy. Um, so if you take vulnerability, uh, I will make an analogy of checking your house for uh, security, like checking the locks, checking the doors, see that no glass is broken. And this is something that Fleet DM is doing very good. We check our customers' hosts and systems and passwords and whatever, and we can fix it using MDMs, using scripts, and we can even schedule a technician with the new calendar fleet, uh, fleet in your calendar uh, um, mechanism. We do that very good. Um, EDR is different. Uh, for vulnerability, for, for, for fixing your lock, you can set a calendar a week from now, that's okay. But EDR is something else, it's a different thing. It's about an alarm system detecting a burglar in your house right now. You need to know about it right now and you need to take action. This is the analogy. Now going from the analogy to the real world or Square, uh, what is the difference? So. When we use OSQuery to detect vulnerability, we use the concept of tables. A table in OSQuery is a code that lies there in OSQuery that is not used. When we query it, it will run and collect something. For example, select star from processes or for time, for simplicity, the code will run, will get the API for the time, Windows, Mac OS, whatever, will get the results, done. But if we want an alarm system, this mechanism would really suck because it will just give you the point in time of when you queried it. It will not give you anything in between. So if a burglar uh, went into your house in one second, you will not know about it if you poll every one minute. So we need something else. And that is the concept of evented tables in OSQuery. What is evented table? Event, evented table is a table that keeps running once told, once configured, in the background and collects events and it keeps collecting it. And once queried, it will give you the results. I can give you a, an example here. Uh, I created a team on our dog food called System Events that is being configured with MDM stuff uh, to, to get full access, etc. cetera. Uh, and I have a few queries that run constantly uh, and get events. So for example, the uh, OS query events is a collection of all events being collected, the numbers that I have, this is specifically on my MacBook. There's also a Windows, uh, currently it's zero, but it uh, doesn't matter for the sake of the demo, like how many processes I have, 68,000 just in uh, because I have a limit. It, it was a million, uh, more than a million uh, some time ago. This is the collection, th this is the summary of all events. We can collect specific processes, like you can see the processes in my that ran in my computer. If I will run calculator and close it, and I'll run the query again, you will see it. You will see the, uh, the, uh, the that calculator was running. Uh, for sake of time, I will not do it, but you can see it. Same thing for uh, theme. We have nothing uh, here because it was cleared, but uh, this will actually uh, check that uh, there was no event on the file events. Um, and with that, I would like to uh, show a video about FIM. Uh, FIM is File Integrity Monitoring. Let's watch the video together. I hope that I shared with sound. Let me just make sure. Share sound. FIM stands for File Integrity Monitoring. The goal in collecting these events is to make sure that no critical file or files or folders were compromised. A good example for that would be an OS file that should never be modified, being modified and could lead to a 
compromise on the host or some malicious activity that's going on. So first we need to understand what's under the hood. How does OS query collect events uh, or specifically the theme events? There is an OS query table that collects those events called file events. And it will start collecting event, events if it is told to do so or configured to do so. It keeps all the events that it finds locally on the host, and then it sends them when it is queried. So let's first see an example of how we configure um, the table, this table. So what we need to do first is go to settings, teams, the relevant team, and set the agent options. The first thing we need to do is set the flags. Those specific flags generically say OS query can collect events. A second thing that we need specifically for the file events is to set file pathways. We can give it any category that we want. I just call it my fleet. It could be anything else and it could be several paths and we need to give it the path we want. Obviously, this needs to be some OS files or some critical folder. In my case, for the demo, I just put uh, my personal folder. This will never be okay for a group of people, a group of people because this has my name. It needs to be something generic that all hosts can collect. Uh, but again, for the demo, this is good enough. It will collect anything under this file. So I will go to my host and query, select start from file events where action is deleted. Let's run it. Here you can see that the last two lines are those files that I just deleted. You can also see that one of the columns is the category I set, my fleet. I could set anything else. And of course, I can have any other action as well, not just deleted, any update or um, creating a file or whatever I want. So how do we collect those theme events? Um, one method I can think about is using scheduled queries. So I prepared this query um, some time ago. And uh, if we will drill into this, you will see that it collected some delete activities of these two files. What's in this query is this deleted collection. And if something exists and it pops up as a, an answer, you know something is wrong and it could be forwarded to a third party location that will uh, send a message or shout in any way about this problem. So schedule queries could be one way to do that. It could be every five minutes, or it could have much higher uh, frequency, which could be every 10 seconds, and then you get uh, real time events of them. Another way to do that is to create a policy. So I created this policy of select one where not exists anything on this table which of course will fail on my computer because i just did some things and if we will go to my computer we will see that we have a policy failing so in this video we saw how we can collect theme events using two methods in fleet dm one of them is the schedule queries and another was policies thank you very much okay Thank you, and we'll continue. Uh, does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, um, so let's continue with Victor showing a few bug fixes and improvements. Uh, thank you, Sharon. I'll try to be quick. We're probably going to run over. Um, as engineers have about 30 bucks to show, so. First one is this uh, fleet control apply workflow that customer support has run into. Um, so previously when you do fleet control, get labels, YAML, pipe it to labels.yaml. Um, so, you know, have my labels there and they include built-in labels. Previously, when you try to apply fleet control apply, it would fail um, because we had these built-in labels, even though you didn't actually change these labels. So the bug fix is now this workflow works. Um, 
But if you modify <clears throat> so small fonts, if you modify even like changing the semicolon and try to apply, then it'll catch catch that difference. So you, you can apply if they did not change. So this is basically to support this workflow where you get them, maybe you add some labels and modify some manual labels and then you apply. Um, so this workflow is supported now. Um, so next bug fix is we had an issue where IPv6 address was not displayed when it was the only private IP. Uh, so I created a host on DigitalOcean and I had a video how to create one, uh, if you are interested, um, that used IPv6. So this host now has a private IPv6 address and it is being displayed correctly now in Fleet. So moving on to the next bug, this is a bug that we found during development. So let's go to policies. So you see in, pol in the policy uh, screen, we have these stats here. We got five host passing, zero host failing. So if I go to this policy and I modify um, the platform, previously it would not uh, update the stats. So now if I save and then go back to policies, see the stats have been updated. So now they, they've been cleared out because, because the, the platforms are now different. So you know we couldn't, the previous stats were not reliable. Now we're clearing out the stats once we update the platform on a policy. Um, next, we'll uh, talk about some MySQL. So I've been doing some optimization with MySQL. Uh, first is we had a, I guess so we have a long running bug with activity, activity feed, which is, which is basically a MySQL bug. Right, so if you have a an activity feed that has a live query that's very big, in this case, I artificially created one that's one megabyte in size, and then you go to our uh, you know front end and you try to page through the activity feed, uh, eventually it's not going to show anything, and because there's going there's a MySQL bug because it can it couldn't sort all these rows um, with this large amount of data in one of the columns. Um, so this has been fixed basically by uh, sorting first and then afterwards fetching the details of each activity. Um, so that fix that fixes that issue. Um, the next MySQL bug um, was from the community that had a long running MySQL query. Um, Basically, this was the old query. It was, it was basically ran on the entire table, did a count on the entire table. And if you've got millions or tens of millions of entries in this table, it would take quite a while. So basically, I broke this apart by fetching 100,000 items at a time. Um, so that's just a fix for the community. Uh, next is a couple performance issues we saw in production. Um, so one is we have this uh, pattern that we use. Uh, we do an update, and if nothing was updated, then we insert. So like when we're inserting new software items or, or, or something new in our database. Uh, but in some cases, this update insert is happens inside of a transaction. So if you imagine a bunch of new posts are enrolling, um, they're all doing this pattern. And what happens when you do an update that doesn't update anything is it basically locks all the IDs um, above the latest ID. So if these two updates happen, they lock all these IDs, and then the insert tries to happen, and it's waiting for this lock. So this one's waiting for this lock, this one's waiting for this lock, and you get a deadlock. Um, so that's been fixed by basically it's a kind of a custom fix um, for that for that one specific specific use case. Um, but this is just something to be aware of um, when when we're creating uh, when we're creating a new SQL queries. So I'll, I'll move on to the next bug. Um, 
yeah, the next one, basically I optimized this query. Uh, so we had this query that ran once an hour. So this was definitely noticeable in production. Uh, and as you can see, it does an insert into policy stats and it has a nested select. So a select subquery and inside that another select subquery. And it groups over policies and teams. So as you can imagine, as you, as you have more global policies and more teams, this exponentially gets, the performance of this gets exponentially worse. And because it's an insert, it mean, means it's writing data into our main, into our master database. It ends up locking these policy membership tables. And so when these policy membership tables are locked, no host can update their policy results. So you can imagine um, we get a delayed response to, uh, to policy updates. Um, so the fix to this particular case was to basically you know, do the select separately. And then also, instead of doing this Cartesian product, basically loop over the policies instead and do a select for each policy. There's a two-step fix there. Last thing I want to cover is we had a, I found a bug in our fleet, the Chrome extension, um, where basically it was running its, its main thread. Let me annotate its main thread twice because it runs main by default. And then there's also an alarm. And if that happened, it's basically a race condition. So this alarm is here just to keep it alive. Um, so if like the regular timeout and the alarm happen at the same time, then it runs twice. And then, you know, we got extra responses and, you know, bad stuff can happen, especially if both of these threads are trying to initialize the database at the same time. Um, so that's fixed. That should be, that should come out in the next uh, Fleet Geek Chrome release. That's it for my bugs. Back to you, Sharon. Thank you, Victor and Rachel Perkins next. Yeah, we're going to skip me for time. Uh, just small uh, UI fixes, like we have a new URL validation and email validation. So we're saying goodbye to old regex validation and uh, JavaScript validations. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Jacob. Next. Yeah, well, we can similarly keep it brief. Um, I just migrated uh, an external libraries, uh, CVE tools from the NVD tools repo into fleet. Uh, nothing to show there, but consider that a foreshadow for something that Tim will have in the future. Um, a couple UI fixes, missing tooltip, and uh, one interesting situation where uh, an older customer had some queries with invalid platforms that they had in their database from before when we added validation uh, to the platform field for queries. And that was leading to some interesting UI and we're just showing a descriptive error message saying, so, so if they open that query in their UI and they see just the select option for the platforms in that query, uh, now if they try to save it, they get it informative error message saying, please update the platform uh, before saving. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. And Lucas, next. All right. I'll try to be quick to a um, bunch of bugs. Um, all right. Where results are displayed. I'm going to open this just a sec. Um, Core results are displayed after host changes team. So I think we can see this in dog food. Well, I'm not going to go to dog food. It's right here. Um, this host, and it was Nova's host, was moved from one team to another. And those, you can see duplicated um, core reports. And that happens because uh, both teams have this uh, probably the same queries. So the fix is, you know, we don't want to see this. Uh, so, real quick, I'm going to demo that. So we have um my host here um the uh, so go to queries we have uh these queries uh let me see what, what team i'm on team canary 
Uh, so let me refresh that. I thought I should be seeing, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, this is demagogues because I did a, a GitHub supply and it removed the query, I think. <laughs> All right, but in any case, uh, we have we see some queries here, and if I transfer to so the reason you see duplicated here is because one is global, right? We should eventually maybe mark one here as inherited. Maybe that's already what the team had already implemented. So um, I transfer to um, workstations. Yeah, so we can see one of the results is gone. That was the fix. Uh, you you should only see the queries for the team. Uh, next bug. Okay, this is simple. There's no nothing to demo. Uh, this user was uh, running uh, live queries in Fleet, and they were not getting. Uh, so it was running against uh, thousands of machines, and some of them were not responding. And after a, like very long troubleshooting session, we found that Cloudflare was actually blocking their traffic. So the, the query was getting to the device, but the results uh, was being blocked by Cloudflare. I believe there's some machine learning there that was blocking the request. And we've actually submitted a, a PR on the OS query team because uh, we weren't getting enough debug information. For example, these were three retries against this endpoint, and there was no error or anything. And this is because Cloudflare uh, was blocking uh, blocking this request. So there's an open, there is a PR nose query to actually show the error, and you probably would see Cloudflare is blocking your request, something like. That. All right, next. Um, all right, this is simple. Uh, if you go to Dogfood, you will see that every Linux host there doesn't have users. Uh, I believe this bug was introduced when we added support for Chrome. Uh, it was easy fix. Basically, if you go now to a Linux host right here, uh, you will now see users. That's it. it the, the fix was simple. Um, next bug. Uh, this one was found uh, in the, uh, for on our cloud customers. Um, so real quick, um, there is uh, they have here HTTP one since HTTP one point one. So yeah, also HTTP 2 and 3. Um, the goal here is to reduce um, you know, overhead. And so you can reuse the same TCP connection for multiple requests. You don't need to open a new TCP connection. Uh, this is an old technology, right? But it's still going on, going on and happening on HTTP 2. Um, and what happened is on this uh, bug is that uh, the AWS uh, load balancer by default, it will terminate the connection after one hour. So imagine you are, you are using your workstation, Fleet is, Fleet is connecting to, uh, you know, to Fleet. Um, and that connection was open for more than an hour, then the, the ELB would close the connection and you would get errors. Um, and customers were uh, mentioning that they were seeing errors because of this connection being closed. So what we did is just um, we we are now making Fleet D close the connection at 55 minutes so that customers do not see this error. Um, all right. Um, what else? I think that's about it. So real. Oh, this is uh, this one is fast. So Git and Bar GitOps. Uh, so in GitOps, uh, we you can have uh, variable variables, right? Like, um, but in this case you, for example, don't want because ABC is not an environment variable. It's just a secret there with a dollar sign. Sometimes you want to use a dollar sign for a query. Who knows? So we added a capability here in, in GitOps. Um, so if I open um, OK, uh, just a sec. If you see, for example, I have this query collect fail login attempts, and I want to actually leave the ABC there, you just escape it, and then uh, you can apply it. Um, and if I go to that, what is it? Collect play. All right. If I go to there, um, you go to queries. 
well, I don't know why it's not there. Maybe I'm okay. I'm using the wrong. Is it this one? Okay, there we go. ABC, none escaped. Uh, that's about it. Okay, great. And last for endpoint team, we'll have team. Yeah, two quick ones. Uh, we had a Windows OS version detection bug. Um, two. Uh, the, the two most important uh, uh, parts of the version for Windows OS is this major version, which um, uh, uh, maps to, you know, uh, H2 something. I'm uh, I'm blanking on it right now. Um, and then we have this uh, update build revision UBR. Um, so this is before what we we're doing. There was a bug in the, in the kernel info. Uh, I think it was a technical Windows 10 bug. Uh, but uh, we're we're now grabbing it from uh, from the registry. Also to note, um, uh, OS query five point twelve has the UBR in the OS versions table, so uh, that'll probably be a, a future enhancement. Um, the next one is uh, a bug in uh, resolved inversion was not populating if if there was if there was a four part version um, version. Uh, that should be fixed as well. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Luke, back to you. This concludes the work that we released for this sprint. Cool. Thank you, everybody. I put it in the chat, but if anyone didn't see it, uh, I've extended sprint demo starting today and moving forward from one and a half hours to two hours. Uh, demos, Y'all's demos are, are great. They're not taking too long. It's just that we keep having more and more cool stuff to show off, and that's a good problem to have. Uh, this is a really important and valuable meeting for the, for the uh, for all of us, right? The community and, and our customers and, and the business. Uh, so uh, definitely worth uh, investing that time. Understand with the last minute change if anyone needs to drop early. Uh, and with that, heading over or handing over to George and MDM for their bug fixes and improvements. All righty, starting us off is Dante. I think ultimately all of ours can be theater provided if you wanted to, but uh, if you have anything else to demo about these fixes, Dante, go ahead. Take it away. Yeah, sure. Uh, so this fix is the Linux wipe command. Uh, it used to be that if you wiped a system, it would just kind of end up freezing and the command would never return or register that it had finished with fleet. Uh, and now it does that. And also, uh, previously, your system would just remain in a powered on, but kind of zombie state where all the important files had been deleted. Uh, now when you wipe, you'll see it'll do that. And also, it should, in a second, once it's done wiping, power off the machine. Uh, and that's, act yeah, okay. And there's actually some very interesting stuff going on there with how that works. Uh, because the problem was, how do you power off a machine if you've already deleted the shutdown binary? And the solution was use uh, the kernel sysrq commands, which is something that's very interesting I'd like to talk about during a eng together if I get the opportunity. Uh, this is going to take like a second to wipe, so I won't get you all to stick around. For... Yeah, there you go. Okay, so the machine's off now. Uh, and then this guy should say ran a command. Uh, wiping system will be unreachable. The command finishes, so now the wipe is complete and it will not uh, try to rewipe it if the host comes back online. Awesome. Thank you, Dante. And Gabe? Yes. Um, yeah, I think mine's very much theater of the mind. So it's just um, the fix was for custom profiles. Um, we were having issues with signed custom profiles, but uh, now that's fixed and you should be able to upload, um, sign custom profiles for MDM. All righty. And then on my list was what Martin fixed. Uh, there's a command to install fleet D for windows when you're MDM enrolled. And, uh, while that succeeded the first time for whatever reason, fleet D continued sending it. And, uh, this had no impact. It just filled up the activity log, uh, and the, the, MDM commands ran, um, so that's been resolved. And lastly, we've got Roberto. Hey, um, yeah, I have a bunch of uh, bug fixes here, but they are basically uh, all related to uh, the different MDM status and 
what happens if you wipe a host and the host turns on the MDM, or if for some reason the host turns on the MDM um, for a second time if it was already uh, enrolled, stuff like that. So we sat down, uh, we defined like a consistent story for all of those. Uh, so those are the bug fixes. Uh, this is what I think we should document, but this is what like the rules we are going to do for everything related to enrollment. Um, so that's already in place. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, thank you, Roberto. And that's it for MDM bug fixes. All right, cool. I guess we only needed six minutes extra, so <laughs> no problem to end early. Uh, thank you all, great sprint. Uh, sprint 23, fleet 4.50 vanadium uh, will be going out next week. It's going to be delayed slightly. We know that already uh, because of the app management work. It's uh, going to be 100% done by end of day today, but obviously that's going to delay uh, QA, which will delay the release cycle. Um, so that could take a, a little, will take a little longer than usual. We're, I think we're targeting Wednesday right now. Uh, so, so I'll update the calendar appropriately. Uh, still going to maintain the freeze until then. Uh, and that's it. Any questions, thoughts uh, before we wrap? All right. Have a great weekend, everyone. See ya. Bye, everyone. Thanks, guys.